Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of Proverbs, and uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time, chapter 28, beginning with verse 6. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on Proverbs, uh, they're all uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, now, I, I'm a KJV firstist, so I will read the verse in the KJV, and I may have to look at it in the Amplified if I need some help understanding it, because the Amplified version amplifies it. So let's begin. Verse 6, chapter 28. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Well, better in what respect? Uh, certainly, uh, some people might say, I'd rather be rich and perverse in my ways than uh, a poor person who's, uh, you know, upright. <laughs> some people, if given that choice, might just decide they'd rather be rich. Uh, it is tempting. Uh, money is a great temptation. One of the greatest temptations in life, I'd say money or wealth. And then also the other temptation is uh, uh, sexual lust. These are probably the two greatest temptations that I can think of. So, but Proverbs tells us it's better to be poor and upright than rich and wicked. Um, it's better, well, if you're poor, you'll lack some things that money can buy, but you'll also have things that uh, really are the most important things. As Jesus said, uh, do not seek to build treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy, but rather seek to build treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. So uh, if, you're, if your goal in life is to uh, just gain wealth and material things, you're going to find out that once you take your last breath, you can't take that with you. Uh, but those of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ and received his righteousness and his salvation, um, all of the treasures that we built on earth during our lifetime, uh, the, the, uh, the, through our, our good works and, and where Jesus has eternal treasures waiting for us in heaven, uh, these things will last forever. So I think in that sense, it's, it's pretty clear that it's better to be poor in this world and rich in eternity than rich in this world and, and be lost. Um, now let's look at the verse 2, I mean verse 7 in the KJV. It says, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son, but he that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. So again, it's important to keep in mind that um, the book of Proverbs is really a unique book in the Bible. There's really no other book like it in the Bible in that it's, um, it's not a story. Uh, like Genesis. Genesis is a, a, a historical account. It's a true story of creation and the beginnings of humanity. And uh, the people are real. The stories in it are real. And it's, um, it's it has continuity. Whereas the book of Proverbs is not a story at all, but it's, it's, a, it's a series of truths that we should learn in order to gain wisdom. Sometimes one of these truths or Proverbs is learned in a single verse. Sometimes it takes two or three or four verses strung together to make the point. Um, so in this case, uh, go back in, to the verse 7 in the KJV. Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son. You see, this was written by King Solomon to his son. He explains in the beginning of Proverbs 
that he's writing this down so that his son can learn wisdom. And thank you, Jesus. I, I, I'm, I'm so happy that it was written down and it's, and it's been uh, preserved for our benefit because now not only the son of Solomon could benefit from it, but all of us, all of us can gain from it. But in this verse is talking about uh, following the commandments. Now, it's not telling us to follow the commandments in order to, uh, you know, gain righteousness and salvation. It's following the commandments is there to, uh, so that a person's life will be blessed. You'll have a better life. If, if you're not uh, leading a sinful life, if you're not lying, cheating, stealing, fornicating, adultery, if you're not doing those things, your life will end up being better. If you're making, those are bad decisions. And that's, see, God did not give commandments to us because he says, I know that uh, sexual activity is a great pleasure. Uh, and uh, I, 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 but I'm going to tell you not to do it because I want to deprive you of the pleasure. I don't want you to have a good time. So I'm saying no. no. He tells us not to do certain things, not because he's trying to deprive of us of pleasures, but for our own good. God knows better than us uh, what is good for us. So he says, don't fornicate, don't commit adultery, because these things lead to serious problems in life uh, sexually transmitted diseases unplanned pregnancy un, uh, 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 out of wedlock births you know single families divorces uh, all these things result from uh, not following the commandments and uh, <sighs> So commandments, you, many people misunderstand, think that calling commandments is what gains salvation. But the commandments and the laws in the Bible were never given us to us as a means of salvation. They are given to us as a means of uh, living a good life so that our life will be blessed. We're better off in life if we do the right things rather than the wrong things. So it says here in verse 7, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son. So Solomon is writing this, talking about a father-son relationship. And this is not Father God and, verse, uh, and, the, and uh, us, the believers in Christ who are children of God. This is just talking about if you're a parent, uh, you're, even if you're not a parent, you're at least you're, you have parents. So a parent-child relationship, it's talking about uh, you want your children to be wise. So you tell them about the laws. We, we, if, rather than using the word law, we could just say right and wrong. We teach our children what's right and wrong. And we hope that they'll do right because uh, it's, they'll be wise. And it says, but he that is a companion of riotous man shameth his father. So if you have a son, if you have a child, that is um, a companion of riotous man, you know that, that they're going to end up being in trouble. They're going to do end up doing bad things. Even if they don't do it themselves, they'll be guilt by association. And uh, uh, you don't want that for your children. So it's a, it's a shame. You, you, you feel ashamed if your children are misbehaving and you're embarrassed and you feel bad for them because you know that only bad things come from bad behavior. Let me read that in the Amplified and see how it phrases. Um, <clears throat> verse 7, he who keeps the law of God and man is a wise and discerning son, but he who is a companion of gluttons humiliates his father and himself. See, that's interesting. Uh, in, in the Amplified, it says a companion of gluttons. Uh, a glutton is a person who overeats. Uh, but in the KJV, it says a companion of a riotous men. So a riotous men, I don't think is the same thing as a gluttonous men. Riotous means that you're, uh, you're doing wild and crazy things that can result in you getting in trouble. Uh, uh, you're participating in a riot. Uh, okay, I'll go on to verse... Eight. We're on chapter 28, verse 8 of Proverbs. He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, 
he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. Well, I understood the first part. He that by usury and unjust gain increases the substance. In other words, if you're getting rich by taking advantage of other people and being unfair and charging them more than you should, usury is um, when you charge interest on a loan that is extremely high. I, I don't know the number that they use, but even in America today, I think there are certain laws uh, against usury. I don't, I don't know what the rate is, but if you're, interest rate is exorbitantly high, then you're being unfair and taking advantage of people. So it says here, he that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance. If you're getting rich that way, it says, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. Now that doesn't make sense to me at all. So let me read it in the Amplified. Um, Gathers it for him who is gracious to the poor. Um, well, I don't, I don't know how the part A and part B of verse eight fits together. Really. It doesn't really make sense to me, but, uh, I can say that, uh, the person who's gracious to the poor is going to be blessed. The person who is, uh, unfair, unjust to the poor, uh, it will suffer consequences, uh, for being an unjust person that's taking advantage of others. Uh, I'm going to look at verse 9 next. Verse 9 says in the KJV, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Hmm. So if you are continuing to just um, defiantly, uh, do the right thing and listen to uh, teaching about what right and wrong is, then uh, your prayers are an abomination. God is, your prayers make God sick. God doesn't like your prayers because even though you're praying, you're still persisting in just doing evil, doing the wrong things instead of the right things. Um, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. It says, he who turns his ear away from listening to the law of God and man even his prayer is repulsive to God. Yeah, I can imagine that. I mean, have you ever tried to imagine how God feels about things? You know, we, we understand from studying the scriptures, you know, how God's uh, attitude about certain things. Yeah. And I think that as we, when we put our faith in Jesus for our salvation, uh, and God puts the Holy Spirit into us and brings our spirits to, to life and creates a, a new creature, a child of God. We're born again, spiritually. When this happens, um, then uh, I think we, we can begin to understand the heart of God, the mind of God better, particularly if we combine that with studying the scriptures. So, uh, and as we grow and mature, we can understand better how God feels about things. And in our, in our mind, our heart speak, uh, kind of conforms to that of God. Uh, I think the Bible says that David was a, a man of God's own heart. I think is how it's phrased. A man of own, God's own heart. I think that's referencing what we're talking about here is your mind, your heart complies with what God, the way God sees things. And when, when uh, there's something that would make God repulsed, then it would make you repulsed too. And uh, I'd like to think that uh, yeah, that's that's what uh, I'm feeling when I get righteous indignation over a false gospel or insults to Jesus and the finished work on the cross. These things make me sick. And I'm sure it makes God sick too. So let me read that again in the in the um, in the KJV. It says, "He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination." Uh, the verse ten says, "Whoso causeth the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit." but the upright shall have good things in possession. 
So if you're causing that righteous to go astray, if you're leading people astray, then uh, there's going to be a consequence for it. It says, uh, you shall fall into your own pit. So we've got to be guard against leading people astray. Uh, you can lead them astray in a lot of different ways by leading people into bad activities, like uh, being a companion of riotous men, as it said in the previous verse. That would be leading someone astray, bringing them into that kind of a situation and tempting them with riotous life. Or, um, and, but the other thing that uh, we can have lead people astray is, is teaching them uh, false doctrines, or more than anything else, the damnable heresy that uh, salvation comes through works. This is this is the damnable heresy that rather than salvation coming as a free gift from Jesus Christ to all who that believe and trust Him completely, rather than that, some people are saying no, salvation is earned through your own merit uh, if you're really good if you work try really hard and you'll earn salvation that would be leading people to stray you know leading them uh, to a damnation uh, so uh, if that's what you're doing then you're going to fall into your own pit you'll suffer some consequences for that now let me look at it uh i'm gonna look at that same verse uh 10 in the amplified he who leads the upright astray on an evil path will himself fall into his own pit, but the blameless will inherit good. Okay, verse 11 in the KJV says, The rich man is wise in his own conceit, but the poor that hath understanding searches him out. Wise in his own conceit is uh, a phrase that we find other times in the scriptures wise in his own conceit let's see how it's phrased in the amplified the rich man who is conceited and relies on his wealth instead of god is wise in his own eyes so a person who's conceited they they they, they uh, really think very highly of themselves more highly than they should that's what conceit is instead of humility they have conceit and pride uh, so the rich man who is conceited and relies on his wealth instead of God is wise in his own eyes. But the poor man who has understanding because he relies on God is able to see through him. So the question again is, are, is it better to be poor and rely on God or rich and be wise in your own conceit? I'll choose poor in terms of poverty or lack of wealth in this life because uh, I'll be rich in eternity uh, because the priorities are correct. Let's look at this in the KJV. The next verse is verse 12. When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. So... When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. Well, that's not hard to understand. But then it says, but when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. Uh, I don't understand that. Let's look at it in the Amplified, see if it makes sense out of that. It says, when the righteous triumph, there is great glory in celebration. But when the wicked rise to prominence, men hide themselves. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, how can you blame them? If if wicked people rise to power, you better hide from them. You better because they're they're wicked. They're going to uh, mistreat you uh, and be wicked to you. So we need to pray that uh, wise men rise rise to prominence. And that you know, there's elections taking place to right now. As I speak in uh, the state of Iowa, the first pre presidential ballots that are cast in this this year's presidential election being done right now, the the primary 
election in Iowa. And let's all hope and pray that uh, a wise man rises to prominence instead of a wicked man. I made a video about that the other day in my watch. It says, um, uh, Iowans, please listen before you vote. So if you want to know what I say, I don't, I don't spend any time talking about politics on my channel. This channel is reserved for ministry, uh, theology, soteriology, that's salvation. Uh, but I did feel the need to say one thing about this coming election. So you can watch that video if you're interested. Now, on to the next verse. Um, verse 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Covering your sins is just kind of denying them, uh, not admitting that, that you do have sin. And we meet people like that every day. Uh, so, some of these people who deny they have sin are they're not Christians. They don't even profess to be Christians. They just think that they're very good people or that there's no such thing as sin. And yet I also meet a lot of people that uh, they name Jesus as, as uh, the Lord and Savior and they claim that they're Christians and yet they continue to act like they don't sin and that other people do and you know, they want to judge other people and they're full of spiritual pride and self-righteousness. And that, that, it makes makes me sick. It's that's repulsive to me, and I think that's because God has changed my mind and hearts to conform with His. I'm sure that makes God sick. The only time in the Bible that I see Jesus get very upset with people and angry with people, uh, it, it was when He's dealing with the self righteous, uh, prideful, uh, religious people, the Pharisees. Okay. Now, um, uh, verse 14 says, Happy is the man that feareth alway, but he that hardeneth his heart shall fall into mischief. So feareth alway just means you're always being uh, careful because you know that if you do something wrong, you're going to end up suffering some consequences. So, uh, you know, the people who are cautious and careful in life, uh, let me see how it's phrased in the Amplified. Blessed and favored by God is the man who fears sin and its consequences at all times. But he who hardens his heart and is determined to sin will fall into disaster. Sin does causes disaster. There are consequences for sin. But thankfully, we can all say thank you, Jesus, right now. He died for our sins. He paid for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says he's the propitiation for our sins. A propitiation means he made the full payment. Uh, he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only. That means those who are believers, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. So sins are paid for. But does that mean that you should just go on sinning? No, there are consequences in this life if you want to continue sinning. Uh, it's just like breaking the law. If you get caught breaking the law, uh, whether it's God's laws or men's laws, uh, you're a lawbreaker and you'll end up going to jail or something. There are some consequences. But thank you, Jesus, the, uh, for, for Christians, those people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, one consequence we don't have to worry about is we, we will not go to hell. Uh, we are going to go to heaven. That's guaranteed because of our faith in Jesus. But that, that doesn't mean that we should just go on and sin and, and uh, uh, without cons counting the, the cost of our sins now, uh, which will be uh, smoking. Uh, if that's a sin, look, the consequence is bad health. Drinking alcohol too much, what's the consequence of that? Bad health, alcoholism, uh, losing your job, losing your wife, losing your family, uh, fornicating, adultery. What's the consequence of that? Well, losing your wife, divorce. All these, these things are consequences. Um, stealing from your employer. What's the consequence of that? Going to jail if you get caught. Now let's look at it um, back to the KJV. 
uh, verse 15, as a roaring lion and a raging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. Yeah, it, it, it's horrible when people have to live with a, with a tyrannical ruler. Verse 16, the prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor. But he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. Hmm. Well, I'm going to hope that the Amplified can explain verse 16 to me. Verse 16 in the Amplified says, A leader who is a great oppressor lacks understanding and common sense, and his wickedness shortens his days. That's pretty self-explanatory. But he who hates unjust gain will be blessed and prolong his days. So you should hate unjust gain. You should not want to be unjust to people just to make more money. Uh, verse 17 in the KJV says, a man that doeth violence to the blood of any person shall flee to the pit. Let no man stay him. Let no man stay him. Uh, I think that would be show him mercy, maybe. Let's see how it's phrased in the Amplified. A man who is burdened with the guilt of human blood, that is murder, will be a fugitive until death. Let no one support him or give him refuge. Yeah. Verse 18 in the KJV says, Whoso walketh uprightly shall be saved, but he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. Now, being saved is not being saved from condemnation in hell. It's being saved from all these bad consequences that come from, uh, you know, sinning. Uh, it, but then it says, so he that walketh uprightly, if you're living your life and doing upright things instead of wicked things, you'll be saved from being caught, being judged, being suffering the consequences. But he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. Let me see how it says it in the Amplified. He who walks blamelessly and uprightly will be kept safe, but he who is crooked or perverse will suddenly fall. Okay, now to verse 19 in the KJV. It says, he that tilleth his hand, no, I'm sorry, he that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after his vain persons shall have poverty enough. So here, I'll read that in the Amplified. It says, uh, he who cultivates his land will have plenty of bread. If you're willing to work, you're going to have food. You're going to have plenty if you'll be diligent and work. But he who follows worthless people in frivolous pursuits will have plenty of poverty. So the Amplified, I mean, the, um, the Pro book of Proverbs is full of contrasts. Comparing a lazy person gets poverty, a diligent person gets success, um, a, uh, um, uh, a, a fool gets bad things coming in his life, a wise person gets good things. A person who wants to follow God's laws and man's laws will get good results out of their life. If you want to break God's laws and man's laws, you're going to suffer consequences. These are contrasts throughout the whole book of Proverbs. So hopefully, not only will we learn these principles and understand them, but wisdom is applying them to our lives. And uh, hopefully that's what we're going to gain from the study. Now, I think that's enough for tonight uh, from these verses. I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about salvation. Uh, so if you're if you're watching right now and you are a professing Christian, I want to make sure you you have your theology correct about salvation. And if you're watching now and you you don't know the theology of salvation, uh, you don't know what is required of you so that you can go to heaven. In other words, then I'm going to tell you now um, because and this will probably shock you. You'll probably be amazed because very few people have heard this. But what I'm going to tell you here, this is the Christianity that you find in the Bible. This is not the 
Christianity you hear in churches around America or on from televangelists or on the radio. Um, most of those messages are a false message of salvation. Um, for example, if I ask you the question, uh, do you think you're going to go to heaven and why? What would you say? Think about that. Answer it in your mind right now. Why, why in the world should God let you into heaven? If, if God said, why should I let you in? What would you say? How, what would you plead? What would your plea be to God? Most people answer that question by saying that, well, I would tell God that I, I've been a good person. You know, I've, I've tried really hard to, you know, be moral and upright. And, you know, I even got religious. I, I joined a, a church. And I attended church. And I, I did my best to uh, follow the golden rule and even the Ten Commandments. And I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, I've done well enough and, and God says, you're good enough. You can come in. Is that what you think? Is that what you think is the means of salvation? If you perform well enough, if you behave well enough, God will accept you and say, okay, you're good enough. You made the cut. If that's what you think, then uh, welcome to the philosophy of the world. That's what the world believes as a whole. That's even what you learn in many churches today. That's what's been taught throughout all the history of man. And I'm here to tell you now, that is a lie from the devil. The Bible says that not, none of us are righteous, not even one. The Bible says the standard we've got to meet, if we want to tell God, I'm good enough to get into heaven, we'd have to be perfect. The standard is perfection. Jesus said, go and be perfect as my father in heaven is perfect. And the scripture says, we all fall short. We all fall short of the glory of God. What is the glory of God? That is perfection. Jesus Christ set an example for us. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And he, that's the standard we've got to meet if we want to get into heaven based upon our own merit. So here's the glory of God. And here's our efforts. Some of us are a little better, a little worse than others, but we all fall short. No one, it's not possible for a single person to go before God and say, I deserve to get into heaven because I've been perfect my whole life. I've never done one thing wrong. I haven't even had one bad thought. That's impossible. That's what Jesus taught his apostles. He said, with well, man, they asked him, well, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, with well, man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So it's impossible for you to get saved through your own efforts, through your own righteousness, through self-righteousness. But it is possible with God. So the Bible says that God commendeth his love toward us. That means God demonstrated his love for us. And that while we're yet sinners, and that means in spite of the fact that we're sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died for us, even though we're sinners, and proved how much he loves us. He was willing to die for us. Now, when he died on that cross, he, he bled, he suffered, he died. The Bible says that he is the propitiation for our sins. It says he became sin for us. It says all of your sins and my sins were charged on Jesus Christ on that cross. So every bad thing, every bad thought you've ever done, Jesus paid for it. And that's that's the greatest love of all. That you, Jesus said there's no greater lo love than being willing to lay down your life for a friend. That's what Jesus did for you. Uh, but after he died, he was buried in the tomb for three days. He raised himself back to life. And this resurrection was promised before he was uh, crucified and buried. He predicted that he would raise himself back to life as a sign. He called it the sign of Jonah. He said, uh, destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it up. 
he was talking about his body. He would die, be buried, but raise it back to life on the third day. And he did it. Now, the reason he did that was to give us uh, evidence, proof that he is God, that he is the Savior, that he does have power over life and death. So with his death, he paid for our sins. With his resurrection, he proved his claims were true, that salvation comes through him. He says, I'm the way. I'm the way to heaven. I'm the one and only way to heaven. He said, I'm the truth. What is it? What's true? What is what? Are, what is it you need to believe in? You need to believe in Jesus Christ. He's the truth. Believe in his ability to save you. Believe in his faithfulness to save you. And he said, I'm the life. That means he is the source of life. He is the life giver. He is life everlasting. And when you put your faith in him, he gives you life everlasting. You get to live forever in heaven in joy and bliss forever. So the point that you need to really understand is that if you try to get to heaven through your own efforts, you're going to fall short and, and you're going to fail. For that reason, God decided to intervene and said, I'll come to mankind's rescue. God became a man named Jesus Christ and he died for our sins and he was raised from the dead. All this for you and me so that we can receive the gift of salvation. That's right, salvation's a gift. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Jesus died instead of us. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It says eternal life in heaven is a gift. A gift is something that, you know, you just accept, you just receive it. You don't have to pay for a gift. If someone gives it to you, they paid for it. So it says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You get the gift of eternal life in heaven from Jesus simply by believing and trusting him. I hope you'll do that. If you do, please make a comment on this video now. And I hope you will join me nightly for these Bible, Bible studies, 7 p.m. Pacific time, nightly. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.